What's going on, everybody? We're here. We're live. Welcome to a brand new Poker Live podcast live stream. My name is Joey Kimon, a.k.a. Chicago. Joey, joined today on the podcast by a young gentleman who, you know, last time we had him on, it was, you know, some crazy shit was going on. This time we got him on, some more crazy stuff's going on. It's a man who I've been enjoying watching on these Poker Night in America cash games. He seems to be a man who's who's crushing it on some of these games. Uh, long time high stakes poker player, long time member of the community. Uh, hashtag stand strong with Sean and one of the most sympathetic figures ever created by Poker Night America. We're joined by the man, the myth, the legend himself, Sean Deeb's in the house. What's up, Sean? Welcome back to the podcast, man. Well, I don't know how I can follow up that intro with anything, but hey, guys. What's going on, man? How uh, how was uh, how's the weekend, man? You had a fun weekend? Uh, it was uh, very exciting. Uh, you know, two of the three days were great. Uh, one day was miserable, but, uh, you know, I made money every day. I was actually supposed to uh, fly home on Saturday, but, you know, my wife, uh, when I was in the car, said uh, the, bir- the party I was going back for, I didn't have to go. So I actually turned the car around and went back and uh, tried to play poker night, but I ended up playing the tournament anyway, ended up getting 10th. So uh, it was still uh, pretty exciting, uh, you know, a couple extra days. How's it feel just to turn the car around and then get 10th in the tournament? How does that feel like? It felt awful because I was pretty much chip leader from the minute I registered to like 20 minutes before I busted, you know? I almost went truly wire to wire. Pretty crazy, man. How, how yeah. crazy would that be if you're going back, you turn around, especially after the weekend that went down, then you win the tournament? I mean, that'd be... <laughs> yeah, I, re- I felt like I was destined to win, you know? I mean, everything was pointed to me winning and just, you know, laughing at someone else who, quote, unquote, was a tournament winning player. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll see. But uh, unfortunately, I, you know, took a beat and then I was tilted and I just jammed it all off every hand. Really? That doesn't sound smart. Eh, whatever. It was just a 1K. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you know, I guess we'll get into that, that top story everyone's out there interested in. So this weekend, if anybody missed it, I got a video up on my YouTube channel where I kind of talk more about it. Uh, Pokemon in America was different than it may normally be. Normally, I feel like it's a very jovial attitude. You got Sean slow rolling people. You got people trying to slow roll Sean. A little bit needles flying back and forth. But this weekend was unique for a couple different reasons. One was, of course, Brandon Cantu and you know what we'll talk about that a little bit about that other one was this guy hashtag king man so obviously hashtag king you and him got into it pretty good um a lot of comments were said very you know uh, very intense comments derogatory comments towards family towards uh you know wife shout to ashley towards each other so what's kind of your take your take on, on what happened this weekend man because obviously it seemed pretty out of line most people in the community who said what the fuck is going on why would this ever be on air you know what is happening this this just is just this is not what People want to see, I mean, they kind of like it from an entertaining standpoint, but in terms of like, I mean, is this what people really want to see when it comes to poker on stream? See, I know when I was really young, really immature and really dumb, I would try to say anything to just get a rise out of people. And clearly that was what the douchebag was trying to do is he was going to spout out whatever random nonsense came to his mind that made no logical sense until something hit a chord. And, you know, he was trying so hard to get under my skin. And, you know, I was, I started off the session stuck like 20,000 one of the first few hands and you know like he's trying to make fun of me for being a losing poker player and all this shit and i just you know i know the guy has no success i know he can't handle it in poker and i know he wants to really make his followers believe he's best in the world but you know he was actually the fish of a game that had mike dentali on the table so that's really saying something <laughs> bang bang i mean i don't know I've never play with mike i know he plays the great game of pot in omaha he likes tank tops i got love for anyone that plays PLO and wears tank tops so but yeah, in a no limit game, I mean, I obviously I don't know much no limit home experience he's got. Yeah, so. I mean, it was it was disgraceful from uh, many parties on that day. So what what was up? Why why did that start? I mean, how did this like how did this this start going back and forth? Were you guys calling you bitch and the scumbag stuff and all? I, I just I, I just don't understand kind of why that happened and why it got to that extent that it did. It was really weird. Like you know, Glance was trying to like kind of get a couple individual battles on the show. You know some grudge match type things. So me and Cantu have our issues over the last few years. So it was me and Cantu were supposed to battle. And then Hashtag and Doug were supposed to battle, you know? And that was kind of like the way it was, you know, set up. And all of a sudden, like, from a, some Twitter spat, because I just kept making fun of Hashtag for being a retarded person. Um, shouldn't use that word, but, you know, sorry, guys. who's was offended by that. But, um, you know, he just started the show just going off on everybody. He got really mad because I made a comment, uh, making a joke for those who don't know that Janine Deeb is not my sister and saying that she was sexually harassed by him. 
So he just went off on like that alone made him want to go off on me from before the cameras even started. And, you know, I hate people who just use a TV poker show as, you know, like they're the only one there. And, you know, he constantly slowed down the action, constantly wanted all the attention. And listen, you know, there's six other people there who deserve a right of some TV time, deserve some time of being heard. And all he did was just talk over everyone and really make it a pretty brutal show to follow along to. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, in terms of the raw numbers of viewers uh, concurrently on Twitch, it, it did very well. And I mean, I don't know, like, you know, all the feedback out there, I made the video I had, a, you know, in the discussion on Reddit poker and on 2 plus 2 on Twitter, I was trying to figure out, you know, like what, because I'm watching this, I'm like, I don't know, I'm like entertained, I guess, in like a very, you know, sort of like, like train going into a fucking wall sort of weird type of way. And I wouldn't you know if entertaining is the word, but it seemed like people out there were obviously watching and interested in it. But at well, the same time, I don't think yeah, it's like it, it's sort of like this reality. And you okay. know, like you, everyone was. I've ne you know, I'm usually one of the villains on Poker in America. You know, I used to be one of them. I still am a very hated player for a lot of things I do. But I've never had so much support in the Twitch community as when I fucking turned that Queen verse hashtag. That shows like people are tuning in because they hate someone and they want to see him lose. They know he's going to lose. You know, people knew he was going to get stacked. They knew there was no way he could win in that lineup. There's no way he was going to survive you know, two hours of play. The only reason he survived two hours is we got one third as many hands because we had to stop every 30 seconds and tell him it's on him. I mean, all he did was try to promote himself and, you know, you, you can tell, we've all spent a, everyone who plays live poker has seen someone who they know is pretty much on case money. And that was very obvious to us very quickly that he was on case money, you know, to wire that little money to play that show, to call us out, to sell action, to do all these things like going into the taping. We knew full well that, he wants to brag about all his money he has, and he doesn't have shit. So, how did it feel when you end up stacking him with the with the queen eight versus his ace king? When you when you shove the river there, you a little bit over bet the river there, and he's thinking about calling, and then he finally calls after this back and forth you have, and then that's it. I mean, that you you sort of you made the you sort of made that happen. Yeah, I was I was really I hope that there's a good camera angle because where I was sitting, I was in C three, he was in five. When I like said you got, he's like, oh, I know you slow roll. I tabled queen eight, and he looked at my hand and actually for a second thought he won because that was not a hand he was thinking of. You know, He even realized that I had two pair that beat his hand. He actually thought he won when he saw my two cards. So there, someone needs to get like that little segment, just like you got the Cantu gift. And just like, because I'm telling you, I saw that, and it was the greatest joy to watch it quickly drain the excitement from his face to realize that he's broke now officially. Mm. So obviously after that, then the that's when these slurs towards family members start coming out. And and it seemed like, you know, obviously there's a lot, a lot of discussion about that in terms of, you know, I mean, I thought you handled yourself pretty well in that situation, you know, and most people out there say, you know, if, if he starts bringing up that, well, then we're going to throw, we're going to throw hands, man. I'm going to pull up, I'm going to hit him in the fucking face or something like that. I mean, I read this everywhere. I've been reading this in comments on my YouTube today. People are saying things like that. But I mean, in that spot, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if that's the spot to go start. Everyone wants to like be a tough guy, you know, keyboard warriors, or whatever. But there's no reason getting a physical alter like altercation with him. A, I could get sued. B, it could go very negative for me. C, I'll probably get my ass kicked. You know, there's no benefit for me fighting. I have nothing to gain. You know, if I hit him once, okay. But there's literally so many more negative sides to that. So you have to be rational. You know, I'm a professional poker player. I want to be invited back to Choctaw, which put in a great event and a great poker night stuff. I don't want people to have to ban me from casinos. You know, that's my livelihood. If I start getting shut down in these places, it's going to cost me money long term. Right. I mean, I think that's what some people don't realize is that if you potentially get into a fight, now you can't play in Poker Night America. And listen, kid, we see some of the lineups you get in. You want to be playing on Poker Night America. Bang, bang. Yeah, but I, I was just like, you, you don't want to not be invited to that show. Hopefully, uh, Glance can get his act together because I asked him a, a, like a week ago for the cumulative total of what I've won on that show, you know. And it's... it's obscene amount of money for quarter 50. Obviously, there's a lot of straddles, and yes, I've ran good in some of the bigger games, but I mean, yeah, it's soft. You know, we get a bunch of amateurs. We get a bunch of recreational players. We get a bunch of people who aren't that good at poker, a.k.a. the Cantus of the world, you know? We get a whole mix of, you know, of players, and even Doug Polk is on the show and doesn't even win, you know? So it just shows that even the supposedly one of the best uh, no-limit players can't win. Must be so someone else is going to be winning. Right. Yeah, I mean, obviously, so these comments got started, and and I mean, what do you even do in that spot, right? Like, what do you what are you thinking when these comments start coming, and it's just like, like what the luckily, fuck is going on? Luckily, my wife is awesome, as a few of you have met her, and uh, she was cracking up. She thought it was hilarious. She loved all these random people defending her, you know, 
uh, whoever was at the table, I think Ite said something, Kyle said something, and she's like thanking all the players, you know, because everyone's got my back and her back, you know. She's an innocent bystander. I make fun of people for what you are and, you know, directly there, but to bring in someone out of the blue, try, like, there's just no reason for that. And, you know, it, I think I would have had to react differently if she was offended. She thought it was fucking hilarious. You know, she was laughing the whole time. She was like, oh, I got all these new Twitter followers. Oh, and as you can see, she's better at insults than I am. And, you know, very few people have gotten her pissed off enough for her to start throwing some shade. And uh, this was one of the times that it came out, and it was so enjoyable to watch. Yeah, I mean, we, um, you know, we did it like when then on a break, I did a little stream and she was in the chat. So hashtag like we were talking about that comment. Then I had him on the Snapchat for a little bit. And she's like, tell him I said he's a bitch and all this stuff like that. So obviously, you know, she can handle herself. It shouldn't seem like, you know, it was really hard to me. You know, someone shit talking you because, you know, I do the same to her that I do to a lot of people at a poker table. So she can put up with me. She can put up with his, you know, worn out shit. Yeah, man. And then, so then he comes back and he's trying to, I've never seen this before, man. I'm telling you, I, I don't, maybe you've seen this before in some of the, in some of the, I, I games, but the guy puts, his, puts his watch down, puts his phones down. He's like, Sean, can I get 1800? Like, I, I've never seen something like that, man. I mean, I've seen watches actually sold at a game once. I've seen a few other attempts, but they were actually valuable watches, not free watches from being a pit DJ. You know, that's a, one of the signs that, you know, the guy has no money is everything he was wearing was free clothes. There was a hard rock sweatshirt, you know, a t-shirt. Like, everything he has is, like, free stuff given to him. He can't afford his own clothes because the guy wants to make fun of me for weight, but supposedly he gained 100 pounds in the last year. So, clearly, none of the clothes that he bought fit in him. So, he has to keep buying new clothes every stop because he keeps getting fatter and fatter. Yeah, I mean, you know, when it comes to this guy, I, I think some people out there, you know, some people said they feel a little sorry for him. They, they do feel bad for him. And, of course... You know, my like when I see this, you know, I, I don't really like wish any sort of ill one on a lot of people. I don't really you know, try to hate anybody or trying to feel that way. And I've gotten a lot of messages from people since that happened from people who have said some things, you know, whether I want to just kind of inform me more, more about his situation in life, his relationship with other people and stuff like that. So, I mean, I don't know. It seems like there are definitely some things going on with him that are that go outside of poker and. I mean, I don't know. And, and you were pretty vocal about not wanting him on a show again. I think Live with the Bike's going to have him on. So what's kind of your thoughts in terms of that as uh, that as this, like, poker content person, him being on these shows? Well, you know, I um, approached people Live with the Bike. I've never been on their show. And I got a hold of them a couple days ago, right at the day after the incident, you know, whatever it was Saturday. And I told them, like, listen, you know, I think he's very bad. I think he's going to hurt your brand. You might get temporary viewership, but you're going to lose a lot of long-term customers. And, you know, the casinos that you have these stops at are going to get complaints because of the way he's acting. They're going to hurt, you know, things outside of poker. And it's just not worth the risk to lose your, you know, your basically your bosses or, you know, your casino deals that you have. And so I said, if you worried about having talent, I'd replace him for the week. And so I gave them that option. And, they, you know, he's like, well, we were just having a meeting. And they discussed and they decided to have him back on. And one of the things I told them is if they choose to have him, which they have, I will just boycott them for the rest of my career. So, you know, they're choosing temporary viewership to get hashtag on one weekend, and they're never going to have me on any episode, any show. And, you know, I think that hopefully more poker players decide to take the same stance I do. And even non-pros, like if recreational people are just like, you know, we'll, we'll go with the hashtag, stand strong with Sean. Anyone who wants to boycott any, like, now Joey, like even you, if you have him as a guest, I'm going to boycott you for the future. That just, you know. I'm, listen, I'm, I'm telling you right now. I, I'm, I'm going to want to have him again. I'm not. I'm not gonna have him on a show again. I, I had him on a show the first time. I was a little bit intrigued about it. I was, you know, I heard this. He's, you know, I'm like, I don't know. Is this real? Is this fake? Talked to my boy Drew. You know, he said, you know, kind of set it up for me. And but now, you know, he's been hitting me up. He wants to do some more stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, after these, these, you know, he put out this post the other day talking about this t a video, alleged video. He's in possession of. I don't know why he's in possession of the video. He's offering, you know people money i listen I, I don't know it's some fucked up shit so like i i think like you're smart but the media who are gonna be you know the lower end guys who just want to get those immediate views and get immediate exposure they're gonna lose a long-term possible you know uh i don't want to say client but you know talent or whatever you want to call me and you know just anyone who gives him exposure is gonna never get me ever again and you know and i hold grudges very strongly the people who i pissed me off over the years this is one of those spots where you know I think I have more leverage, so this is the choice that they make. So Live the Bike is choosing that. I know a couple of other streaming sites that were considering him, you know, have gotten the word as well that, you know, well, Sean will be happy to be on our show. 
but are we going to have him? And I don't know who the hell would ever want him over me because clearly I also have a following. Obviously, I know how to act, and I can still, you know, make enough controversy where you're still going to get that train wreck crowd. It's just, you know, it's going to be a little more peaceful in the end. Yeah, I mean, I, and I've talked to Live at the Bike about this, talked to Ryan, talked to – we had a discussion about this. He kind of asked for my opinion on it because uh, – and I said, I don't know, man. You know, it's uh... – yeah, I mean, I don't want to really like put Ryan on the spot, but you know, it disappointed me because in our discussion, he says, you know, after the Lamone thing, we're trying to go away from that side. We're trying to be more classy, more quality show. I was like, great, you know, I would love to do something like that with you guys. If that's the direction you're going in, and clearly they're having a stutter and they're going back that way. And now, you know, there could have been a lot of things that we could, I could have done with them, and you know, now I'll just never be a part of their show, and I'll never watch their show. I'll never, you know, never contribute any way to help them out. So why such this? Why such a strong reaction from you about it? Why? Why do you sort of? Why do you? I mean, I, I can understand why you feel this way, but is there anything else outside of just the interaction you two had with each other that that makes you feel like this? I mean, I when I first heard about him when he Janine Deeb interviewed him, you know, a year and a half ago, or wherever his term result was, I just knew a person like that. You know, that yes, there are a lot of people in poker like him, but he's the type of person who's going to keep doing stuff for attention. I, I think someone nailed it when they said, you know, he's going to be the next person to, you know, try to do something to themselves on Facebook Live. There's just no doubt in my mind that that's the, the road he's going to end down. And, you know, anyone who contributes to his, like, attention, delinquency, and all his degeneracy and keeps giving him, you know, the attention he wants, he's going to keep striving for more and more until he has to do more outlandish, more ridiculous things. And, you know, I they're going to have guilt at that point. And I'm not going to have any guilt because – I know I try to step away. I know I try to control him. I know I try to control the show. And, you know, and I talked to Poker Night in America and saying, like, you know, in our televised version, let's not include him in any way, shape, or form. I just think there's no reason to give him the avenue he wants and the exposure he wants because it's just rewarding bad behavior. I have children. I don't do things, to, you know, with them when they act up. And this he truly was acting like a toddler. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, obviously since then been kicked out a couple more casinos. I think uh, kicked out Bellagio, kicked out of Chocota, uh, tw- suspended from Twitter, suspended from Facebook. It's, it's, we know what, what's going to happen. There's no one who's going to think, oh, there's going to be a positive outcome. He's all of a sudden going to have some epiphany and be this upstanding citizen. His family doesn't want shit to do with him. You know, his girlfriend broke up with him. He's got no money. He's got nowhere to borrow. He can't go back to Canada because no one fucking wants him there. You know, he always screwed over a bunch of people in the underground community there. Like, you know, the guys are going to just burn bridges wherever he goes. And, you know, he makes comments about not wanting to live to 30. And clearly, like, that's going to be self-inflicted. Yeah. I mean, like you said, you know, I've heard this for some, like, I, I've got a, a weird amount of messages from random people, like, sort of give me information and, I mean, I got one recently, a couple, you know, like an hour or two ago that didn't didn't sound very good in terms of kind of, you know, what I'm hearing. So, the rabbi one. Uh, yeah, yeah, I heard about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just like I, I don't know, man. I obviously I don't want. You don't want to root against someone, like you know, but yeah, there's so many. We we read people for a living, and we know you know how someone's react in a situation, and that's pretty much the only outcome that's gonna end up happening. It's, yeah. it's, it's going to end up spiraling to that point. He's going to have no friends, no money, no life, no attention. And, you know, and he's going to blame the world and say, this is because of you guys. It's going to be one last cry for help. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Well, I guess we'll, we'll, it's to be seen to kind of what happens here. And kind of so one thing I proposed on Twitter I was. That can happen, obviously. But, like, it's just, you know, my instincts are usually on in situations like this. Like, right. we've seen those degenerate guys who have borrowed as much as they could and, you know. That was their last result because of the crippling debt and the crippling attention, the negativity, and you know the lack of respect they're getting from the community. Yeah. So I guess overall, question came up. Obviously, this good or bad for poker question. I sort of proposed the question, and you know, I, I guess from your standpoint, right? What do you think about good or bad for poker? What do you do? You think something like this? That I mean, in a way, this sort of like unites the community. I feel like it. It gives the community something to bond together with against this common enemy in a, in a weird type of way. So. Yeah. But it's still not even worth it because we're better than that to make him an enemy. We just got to realize he's a sad individual, you know, a lost soul of some kind. And, you know, and this is the underside of, you know, gambling. And these are the degenerates that are out there that every person who plays in the casino knows someone who's like him. And, you know, they get really outlandish. Yeah, when they calm down, they're a little bit normal. You know, they were quiet at one point. You can't believe they got to this point. But, you know, losing hundreds of thousands of dollars will affect your mental state. 
And yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a good point you said about this is a, a reality of poker as well. I think Matt Glantz talked about that on Twitter where he wants to show off this real. And for those that don't play uh, higher stakes or even if you play small stakes, you always know some guy who who's lost all their money consistently. It's just crazy, outlandish, thinks they're better than they are. All these type of qualities, you, you, these exist and they run. This is why poker games exist. This is why professionals exist because there's people like this out there that just, yeah, I man, this is like a very, a very real aspect of poker. Their marriage is going to be ruined over, you know, gambling. Let's just, let's step away from poker and not blame poker, gambling in general. You know, there's been m many more families ruined over sports betting, horse betting, you know, pit games, you know, all that stuff. They've ruined a lot more lives because people can lose a lot quicker and a lot quieter there than poker. You know, poker in general is going to be a slower bleed and you have more opportunity to win and less exposure. But you're sitting there playing blackjack. They're going to give you credit. They're going to give you, they're going to, the casino can do all these things that's going to hurt you more long term and be a bigger hit in one bad day. When poker, that's not as likely to happen. Yeah. I don't know, man. The whole entire gambling thing, poker thing, that's another story, I suppose, altogether. So I guess we can kind of wrap up the, this on the ha on the hashtag, King. Do you have any sort of like parting comments? I know people in the chat and on 2 plus 2 said, don't spend like an hour discussing the guy. And I don't, I don't necessarily, I feel like I've talked with, you know, yeah, I have people I call me up asking, yeah. Let's uh, talk about douchebags of poker. Let's go to Cantu. Yeah, let's let's go to Cantu. So obviously this was weird. So Cantu comes to the table. I don't know if this was scripted. My I guess that's my first question. Was this thing scripted where he starts he by the way, the way he asked you for money, I was like, man, this is a perfect like he's he's a pro's pro when it comes to getting these loans. And he asked you for 5K, 2K more, 5K more. It was a it was a clinic textbook on how to how to sort of ask someone for money in, in a game. Well, basically, um driving out there, uh, I was in a car with Glance, uh program producer Todd Anderson. Um, then Tali and Eric Wasserson. So we're all riding a uh, car together. And during this car ride, Glance gets a text from Helmut asking to borrow money to give to Cantu. And Glance is like, hey, I wasn't even planning on playing the show. I didn't bring anything. You know, like, you know, I can't help you out. So obviously Phil texts me next. And I go, he's like, I know you hate him, you know, but do me a favor. And, you know, Phil's one of my boys. So I was like, okay. But I said, listen. Let me loan it to him on the show and with the cameras rolling and let me give him shit for it. Because, you know, I want it. We knew that we were going to battle. This was planned. This was discussed. Helmuth said Cantu was coming to Choctaw to battle with me. He had all these comments planned and all these words. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we get on the show. So, like, I knew I was going to be loaning him, but I knew I was going to give him shit for it and basically slow roll him. He And he knew he was getting 12000 That's how much Helmuth vouched for, you know. It's so like it was all, like, it was scripted in some way, but – it was going to be all our own opinions and comments. And unfortunately, uh, the other character on the show kept talking during this whole, you know, 30 minute intro that we, like the whole discussion we try to have and we could never get a word in. So it kind of got ruined. So we had to start the conversation like three, four hours later and it seemed a little more forced then, but you know, like, um, two of the people that can't just screwed over are, uh, Jason Mercer and Dan Wyman, two guys I've gambled a lot with, have a lot of history with, you know, I know them very well. They're very honorable and, you know, he screwed them both over for money, and I knew a lot of the details, so I called him out for it, and he's sitting there on camera saying, oh, it's settled, and, like, using the word it's settled, like, settled means you square up with someone, you know? Settled means it's taken care of. Well, apparently with both of them, settled meant he had to win X number of dollars in a the tournament, then he'd pay them. So it's more he acknowledged the debt, which is nothing impressive, you know? Settled was the wrong word to use. And then he tried to claim he made it right with all these other people, and then, you know, I'm getting texts from people I didn't even know were involved. Like, hey, you know, he owes my friend so and so this. Like, there's just so yeah. many people that couldn't believe he said on camera that you know that he's upstanding, that he pays his debts, that he's settled. You know, and you trying to you know spin all this bullshit like he's an upstanding member of poker when you know he's just a degenerate gambler who is clearly still significantly in debt and still gambling and still you know holding money back from people he owes. Got to give a shout out to my buddy Dan Wyman, aka not until uh, you know a long time cash game player. Finally found his calling in tournaments. He's been having. I've been calling him for years. You know what I'm saying? I try to convince him to go to these stops with me. He's one of the few guys like uh, I enjoy hanging out with, and we like degen on the side. So uh, I commit, like I think we I helped get him to go to Borgata, then he uh, tournament champions. I've been trying to get him to go everywhere, but I think he's like one of the most underrated no limit players. But I think people are realizing just how good he is nowadays. You, so you think he's a pretty big degenerate, right? You'd say he's a degen, likes to gamble, likes to fire away, likes to maybe get out of line a little bit. Cantu or Dan or both? Dan. Dan. Uh, Dan. Uh, Dan used to be. Now that he's pretty much married, he's slowing down a little bit. 
Mm. You know, he used to be that. I'm like, and I've said this before, but I, I still can't. Yeah, he used to be the biggest knit player. at full ring. He used to be the, the tightest fucking player at full ring back. We call him knit on tilt because he's such a knit. I can't. Like this, this degeneracy transition was one of the most surprising things I've seen from somebody I knew in poker. Yeah, uh, Dan's definitely had different gears in his life for sure. And, uh, you know, MDD is back, so you're going to see him slow down a little bit. <laughs> Shout out to Dan, man. Congratulations, buddy, on, your, on the recent success out there. So let's get back to Cantu. So most people don't know Cantu's story. I honestly, I don't know anything about him. So I think I just, like maybe saw him on television on ESPN back in the day. But I don't, I don't know anything about him. This whole conversation you two had was just sort of like, I didn't know where it was coming from, but I sort of recognized that, you know, it's not an uncommon story in poker where I'm sure people owe you money. I'm sure a lot of people owe you money. So what's kind of his backstory for people out there that don't know much about him? Uh, I think Brandon was a huge tournaments player, like had a success in WPTs, you know, beat up online early day. He was like one of the first lags who just went insane and, you know, would be chipped or out, or out every tournament. And, you know, People with that mentality, uh-oh, we might have a little guest coming in. Uh-oh. Could be a child or an animal. It's, and it's other, solid, or, but he opened the door, stared at me, and then left. Oh, here he comes. Uh-oh. Hi. <laughs> Wait. Who's that? What's up, Poppy? Say hi. Whoa. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Are you supposed to be taking a nap? Yes. <laughs> what? Uh. What's up, brother? What's happening, Poppy? This is Evan J, the one who many people saw my Twitter screaming at me when I wasn't talking to him. Yeah, man. I'll do this. Ignore him. You were big time him on the screen. Want to give a wave? Want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> Hello. You see? Oh, he's waving back. <laughs> no, don't close the laptop. Say hi, Joey. No. Hi, Shiny. Joey. Shiny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go see mommy, okay? No. No? You don't want to go see mommy? Is mommy over there? I sit there. Sit on the bed? Mommy will sit on the bed with you. Go. Watch out for the kitty. All right. Um, so I don't know. Like, Cantu was a big open face guy. He's actually who taught me open face. And, you know, I think he won a bunch of money initially, then went broke, and then won a bunch of money again in open face, and then went broke again, you know. And he's known for sports betting. Just a degenerate in all ways. And I think he screwed over a lot of people for money. And... He's now massively in debt, um, supposedly. I mean, unless my sources are wrong, or maybe he has the money to pay him and just chooses not to. And, you know, he's got a couple kids, a wife, um, and that's kind of his life story. Hmm. So, obviously, this loan thing happens, and then, I mean, I did find it strange that, that he would, you know, I put that on Twitter when I saw the GIF. That GIF was just... That was one of the great... You, you should definitely... Like, you're never going to have one better than that. So I didn't make the GIF, okay, but I did make up the caption, which that was perfect because he borrowed money from you and then he just like, I don't know, just like digged into you the entire episode, the entire time. And I didn't like, I didn't know what. Hard to troll and like just going to the top, but he's so dumb that you actually don't know he's trolling because it's believable for someone who does all the things he does and to not feel guilt or remorse for what he's done to other people shows that like he just has a lack of social awareness that he really has no idea how you're supposed to act financially and in poker and, you know, the people you're supposedly friends with. And he's just taking advantage of so many situations. And yeah, he just kept like harassing me and constantly like going back to topics just to tilt me. And like, it was a huge distraction from the show. Like we were having positive discussion and he would always cycle back to want the attention on him. He literally said like 60% of the words when hashtag was not on the show and he played the last hand, like so few hands. It's like you, he always wanted to be involved when hashtag and can't uh, and Doug were talking about playing a million and Kendall's like, well, I'll be the announcer. Like, who the fuck cares? Why are you uh, including yourself in this? You're not a part of this. You're not like he just wanted to be like he was like the outsider who wanted to be involved in every discussion. And it like seemed so awful to us on the table. It seemed even worse to Twitch because people were calling him a bigger douchebag when hashtag which is very difficult, but it was a fucking, you know, a neck and neck race. If Hashtag was there for eight hours, he would have won, but Cantu was there for eight hours and didn't shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people in the chat obviously did have that reaction. People on, on Twitter, on YouTube said the same things to me. And yeah, it, it was like, how did they have both of these guys on the show? And now I think about it from, from Matt's standpoint, you know, he's trying this out. I can understand that. He's trying out different strategies. Just had him on the pod. We talked about this, sort of seeing what happens, seeing if it works, see if it doesn't work. So I can understand him wanting to try that out. But from your perspective and knowing that you're going to have this guy that you're going to go sort of back and forth with, 
is that something you enjoy being a part of or is that something you would prefer not to not to be in the middle of in that spot and then like eight hours you're just like taking this constant abuse and i, I mean sure you know whatever like we can deal with it we're you know we're, we're grown-ups but at the same time i don't still want to sit there and get abuse thrown my way for eight hours from somebody well, you know in Kenji's defense the last time we played on poker in america was in pittsburgh and for those who hasn't seen that live stream i hounded him for a good couple hours and he was like a beaten dead puppy and was just sitting there taking all the abuse he didn't defend himself he didn't deny anything he just sat there silent and was basically you know in tears and so i knew this time come back he was ready to battle so which i'm fine with you know i attacked him because i think he's a piece of shit and i attacked him because he stole a bunch of money from my friends and he stole a bunch of money from the community and i anyone who does that in the community I want to out them. I want to be involved in, you know, getting the word out so that they can't keep stealing money from other people. You know, whatever dealings he has with Hellmuth, they've had a long personal friendship. You know, Phil's well aware of his history. And that's Phil's option to take that, you know, risk and deal with that. But like other people who weren't aware of the risk they were taking when in some type of financial situation, whether loaning, whether playing open face or whatever with Brandon, I want, you know, the word to be out so they don't make the mistake. And, you know, assume that he's an upstanding person because he's such a known poker player for so many years. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people out there have that assumption when they see a name poker player, someone they used to see on ESPN, someone who's playing Poker Night America even, right? I think that's kind of something that happens is when you see a guy like Hashtag King or Cantu playing Poker Night America now. Well, I mean, to us, it's like, okay, like, you know, makes sense. But I think that a lot of people out there, they just... Oh, wow, you must be good, right? You won a tournament, yeah, like, you're... You must be rich, you're playing 2550, you know, like... They don't realize that it's borrowed money, that it's case money, you know? They see them, it airs a year later, so much shit can go wrong when you're a degenerate gambler in that year. You can be like, oh, you just won 40000 on TV. Like people, you know, I've been playing a lot at uh, Rivers Connectedy here in New York, and all these people are like, oh, they saw Poker Night. It was like a trip a year and a half ago where I won like 30000 Oh, that's so sweet, you won so much money. I'm like, well, that money's been in play like, you know, 50 <laughs> times since then, you know? Who knows, like, what you see on TV is not really what's theirs or I could have not had like I did have all myself but you know there's plenty of people who have you know backers and sold action or you know are down in makeup so you never really know how much money people have in poker so don't believe the results you see in here yeah I mean I think that's how a lot of these guys stay in action especially the charismatic people who maybe can, can get people or convince people uh even there's some people really to get staked or to get people to buy your action yeah, like, look at, I mean, you know, it, he goes deep in every tournament. Who's not going to, like, buy his action, like, you know, or, like, load like, they don't know, you know? Like, there's so many people like that who have just had such good tournament success, but every single time that they watch that tournament, they're broke from that score already, or they just owed more people than they won. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I did I did kind of find his questions kind of interesting, and he talked about being a big troll, and, I mean, I don't know how accurate, I don't know how truthful that was if he's a big troll or not a troll, but... You know, and I kind of enjoyed some of the questions. Like, I didn't, I didn't totally, I didn't, I didn't totally like dislike him. Like some people were talking about, oh, like I was surprised he has, was as hated as he was when I got done filming. You know, I was shocked that anyone was like it was even close. And like, you know, yeah, it was the brunt of most of it, but I expected it. You know, I loaned him money. It was just ridiculous that the the things he was saying. But I knew they were all most of them were half truths. But I really think that you know deep down, like most jokes, there's a hint of truth. So I really believe that he thinks he's you know, could borrow a bunch of money from me. I really think he thinks I would do that to him, you know, and other people would loan him when they really wouldn't. You know, he really is delusional when it comes to that. So I was curious about this. How often are you loaning other players money at the games you're playing? Because it, it almost happened where you guys gave it the King 1800, you can too. I mean, obviously that, you know, sort of taken, oh, taken care of before the hand, but how often does that come up where you're playing with someone and, and they say, hey, can I borrow some money? And you say, you say, sure. Um, I mean, with me, it happens way too often, you know. All the games I play, I'm pretty much the bank, and so I come there with a lot of money, and a lot of people don't have that much money on them, and, you know, the game's playing bigger, and so if, you know, I, I give most people a shot, and most people, you know, I usually figure, feel them out first few times I meet them, and then, you know, you'd be surprised how early I've loaned people with meeting them, you know? That's just something that's kind of been, I've always done. I've definitely been burned for huge figures. But, you know, it's also, there's been times where it's benefited me. You know, I've had good relationships with people. And, you know, being the winning pro, there's kind of things you might have to do sometimes to get action or get people to play with you that you have to take the worst of it in other ways because I'm going to win so much on the table as it is. Yeah, I mean, I called you the bank on Twitter. <clears throat> on Twitter, I didn't actually know you were a, a actual bank all the time on a consistent basis, though, where you're just giving people money. Obviously, you mentioned stakes raised. Some people, they bust. They want more money. 
So how often do you feel like you don't get paid back in an instance like that? Uh, it really depends on what game and what crowd, you know. Um, over the years, obviously, you've seen some other podcasts I've done. There's, you know, a couple big names that I've been holding off. One of them I'm very close to outing, you know. Uh, mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the fence to say it right now, but I think I'll wait and give him, you know, another couple weeks. Didn't you out somebody before? What, what, who was that again? What was that? I, I outed Ellie and a couple Russians. Okay. Okay. Did ever get taken care of? You figure that out? That done? Uh, Ellie was paying installments, and then like six months ago or so, he stopped. So hopefully try to start that back up this week. Um, I, mean, I was getting something, and that's, you know, something's better than nothing. At least acknowledging the debt, paying a little bit towards it. If you don't have the full amount, obviously, you know, they owe a lot of people, but the Russians haven't done shit. They're all pieces of shit, the whole country. Oh, I mean, listen, I'm not going to go that far. Shout out to Russia. Shout out to all my Russian fans out there in the chat. I saw a couple people I, I recognize in the chat. We got the Godfather in there. TT, I believe, is in the chat right now. What's up, TT? We got Mr. Final Table, a.k.a. aka the, the man who has a way with words when it comes to battle rap and thesaurus in the chat. What's up, thesaurus, man? Hope you're doing well out there, kid. Hope the tournaments are are treating you right and making more final tables here. So, okay, so I guess I'm finishing up on this Cantu situation. So, once again, we'll go back to that idea, good or bad for poker. Do you feel like showcasing somebody like like Brandon on a show like Poker Night America, whether it's just a stream or whether it's actually on television that makes it on CBS Sports, do you think those are good things, bad things, or what's kind of your thoughts on that? I, I, I think, like, I hope Cantu's not on future shows. I think he's bad for it. I think giving him the place to, you know, voice himself and act like he's an upstanding citizen because if you're going to go on there and straight up lie and you know if they air that and brandon's like i settled you know people are going to hear that and not know it's true we need like the fact checker you know if we did a segment of poker in america and say fact checker no there's a website that shows you know the four hundred thousand dollars that brandon Cantu owes that's not settled that's been you know for seven eight years that allowing people to just blatantly lie on tv and get away with it and just Choose the uh, story that the audience hears. And, you know, this is the first time maybe 50,000 people on TV Sports ever heard Brandon Cantu's name. He's going to sit there and say, I settled, you know, I made it right. And I say, oh, you know, that's really good by him. You know, yeah, he struggled, but he made it right. But he didn't. So to sit there and fucking lie. And I also, like, try to give more details of the Wyman situation where, like, you know, on day one, he collected, say, twenty, thirty thousand 30,000 from beating Dan and Jake. And then on the second day when he lost, he only paid him 10000 But he says on TV that he paid him thirty or forty. you know. He's choosing to adjust the narrative to fit him to be not as villainy, not as scummy as he was. But, you know, to sit there and blatantly lie about the amounts when you know I can verify with the person who you actually paid and played, then that just shows how delusional and it's just a scary mental state to sit there and be willing to lie on TV, on camera, about your financial situation and, you know, when, when it's all going to be fact-checked. Mm -hmm. So I hope that that stuff doesn't make it to air. And if I do, if it does, I hope they say, hey, this is the person who's involved. If Dan Wyman does a segment and say, no, he lied. He gave me 10000 He owes me 50000 you know. He hasn't paid anything. It's been seven years, you know. That's, that's what I like to see poker. I like to see honesty. Whether it's the negative side or positive side of poker, I'd rather just see honesty trump, you know, all the bullshit in the game. Yeah. Well, I also got a message I wanted to. I was, I was told to relay to you. Hold on a second. I got a message from uh, one of the podcast favorites, actually. Uh, Viffer actually sent me a message. He says, oh. won't, be around, won't be around tonight, but you asked Sean D how he plans on collecting the money he thinks I owe and give him my address if he wants. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Viffer, you're a piece of shit, too. <laughs> I don't, I, so I don't know if that I, did he bring that up? Or I, I actually don't know. I can't quite recall where, where that's from. I brought but. that up publicly because I bought a debt of his that I thought he would be honorable with because we had done some business and he claimed he doesn't know that money situation between him, me and JRB. And so obviously being bank of deep, I'm the one out of the money right now because both sides are saying the other one owes. So I've been trying to get them to arbitrate and that's been very difficult because, you know, both feel like the other one's free rolling them. Sean, how much money, how much money you got, man? You loaning out this money. I mean, you, it sounds like people owe you a lot of money. And obviously on the show, Mac Lance was like, well, I'll put Sean up against Doug, man. I don't know. And I don't know, man. Well, it sounds like things are going well over there, man. I mean, I just play poker. That's what I do. I suck at business. I suck at everything else, but I'm good at poker. But you're involved in business, right? I got some businesses. They're not working out so far, but, you know, I'm still trying to experiment. I got to get my feet wet. I, but the problem is I don't have enough time to devote. I'm sure it'd be very good if I could, you know, focus on it, but I play, you know, 70, 80 hours a week at poker. It doesn't mm -hmm. leave much time for other shit. 
Yeah, I mean, especially when you got the family, you got the kid. I mean, I, I that's always been my main thing when trying to do other things is that it's really hard when you're when you're trying to stay in the zone, when you're playing high stakes, when you really want to stay just completely focused and engaged. It's very hard to do anything outside of that, especially something like business, which just has so many other variables and is so much different than poker. Yeah, it definitely can be a challenge. Obviously, you got the wife and the kid too. So how is it working out in terms of playing that many hours when you also have this family at home that I'm sure that you want to see? I actually have two kids now, by the way. Um, you, had a, you had another kid. Yeah, uh, back in September. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, B, better keep making that money, man. Better stop loaning out money. Yeah, kids need to go to college. I, that's what I tell my wife. I say, you know, when I continue on a life side, you need to let me go play. But uh, no, she does a ton of work. It's really impressive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wife just yelled, uh, I don't remember since I wasn't there. So one of my stories of me being a douchebag was missing my second child's birth to play uh, W Coop. <laughs> Come on. Said, what? Why would you? I mean, I, 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 I did win a term in the day he was born, so I made it right. You know, I dedicated that win to him. <laughs> you won a tournament on W Coop. So, what was like, what's going through your head in that spot? You got your, your kid being born, you got W Coop. How are you? How do you weigh the options, weigh the variables in that spot to decide what the decision to make is? Okay. Well, you know, W Coop is three weeks long. I made a month, I was going to make a bunch of side bets for leaderboard. Obviously, the due date of a child, you know, could be any time within a couple weeks. Um, I also had my sister's wedding uh, that during that time as well. And so I basically decided um, to skip both of them to play W Coop. Uh, it's one of my, you know, times I really enjoy. So I went up to Montreal like I always do. And, uh, you know, my sister wasn't so mad because her logic was, well, if your wife's not mad that you're missing the birth of a child, it's okay. My wife wasn't mad. She says, if your sister's not mad at you missing her wedding, then it's not so bad. So I was up there, I grinded, you know, um, I made uh, day two of a couple tournaments and the wife FaceTimed me at the end of the day. And while she's FaceTiming me, her water breaks. So, um, wow. so, uh, basically she's like freaking out. And so my sister and my dad come over to help out my dad to drive her to the hospital, my sister to stay home with Evan, the oldest. And, uh, so my wife gets to the hospital. She's texting me the whole time. Um, and is like, your father's driving is going to send me into labor. Like make this baby come in the car. And I start laughing because my dad is a bad driver. So she gets to the hospital. She's been there for a few minutes and she ends up uh, FaceTiming me holding a baby. And she's only been in the hospital for like five minutes. And my uh, business partner at the time and cousin had a kid the day before. So I thought they went to the same hospital and she's holding their kid. So I start laughing. And um, I'm like, whose kid is that? It's clearly not ours. She's like, nope, that's yours. And I'm like, no way. And then I hear the background of the nurses talking about, holy shit, we can't believe the baby's here already. Like, she pretty much had the baby in the hallway. Like, no doctor, no nothing. Yeah. And uh, so she ended up getting home. And I saw the kid like two weeks later. It was fine. <laughs> well, that's, that's a unique birth story, kid. I mean... There he is. I say GT, uh, I don't know, man. Ashley, is that GTO? Was that GTO of him to, to, to go to W Coop rather than be present for the, the birth of the second child? Or what do you think? In line or out of line? Uh, well, I told him that he should really try and pay for our child's college. You know, I thought that was pretty important. True. And, uh, you know. I end up losing money on the trip. I, I think <laughs> the GTO part was me just giving birth in 15 minutes. Yeah, how's that happen? So you're on a like you're in the hall. How's that? How does that work? How's that? His dad. His dad was dropping me off, and it's after hours, so we have to go in. Like the entrance is not open to go delivery, and he sees security, and he makes a joke like she's having a baby, ha ha ha, you know. And they're like, "Do you need a wheelchair?" And I'm like, "Oh fuck, yeah, like I need a wheelchair." And I did not know. Like, I got up there, and she's like, "Honey, are are you planning on like having a water birth?" And I'm like, "Yeah." She's like, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> like, you're going to have this baby any minute. And I did. They didn't believe me. I was like, the baby's coming, like, right now. And they're, like, rolling their eyes and giving each other looks. Like, she's being so dramatic. And then I'm like, the fucking baby's here. <laughs> and the lady, the nurse pulls back the sheet, and she's like, oh. <laughs> like, the whole, like, I delivered my baby by myself. Uh, yeah, so being patched out of my plan on having kids, I don't know, man. I don't know if I'm a plan on having kids. Like, it sounds you yeah. got to choose the W Cooper or, or the second shot, second birth of the child, man. Well, I really fucked up both my kids. My first son, Evan, was born on the first Sunday of Scoop, and Chance is born in you know the middle of W Coop. 
we really got to plan our nine months better. It should be good enough at math to not uh, make that mistake. But. We're not planning on doing this again, are we? <laughs> no. No more? Not a third one? I don't think so. Ash, while you're on camera, you want you want to? No, nah, I won't have her comment. I don't want to get. I don't want to start anything up. So I'm not gonna say. It. Never mind. That's it. I got. I got nothing else. Uh, to no, out. I'm taking the high road. I don't have anything. Yeah, yeah. I don't want. I don't want to bring. I don't want to. I don't want to. No, 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 no. We're good. We're good. I said what I needed to. I pre. I, I liked it, man. I liked it a lot. I just wanted to introduce you to Chance. What's up, Chance? Wait, how do you get the name Chance? Because of Chance. No, it's not because of Chance. I like Chance. I said. Do you like this name? No. Do you like this name? No. Do you like this name? Well, like 200 names later, I'm like, what do you think of the name Chance? And he goes, the only one I know named Chance. I don't hate him. That's fine. Perfect. I mean, there. that's how I'm going to pick my kid's name, I'm sure, too. I'll just go you through some names. names. If I, don't hate them, I'll like, I hate this guy in poker for this reason, because I secretly hate a lot of people in poker. So a lot, of the, a lot of the common names, uh, you know, weren't allowed. Okay. okay. So. Well, we got two future pot limit Omaha players right there. I'm very excited about that. We're got to start him young, kid. Let's get him four Never cards before they. Are you getting Evan's already Never. watching poker? Daddy, he was actually watching the second day of Poker Night in America, and he's like, "Daddy," and I'm like, "No, that's not Daddy on there." It's just like looking for him. Wait, which one was he calling Dad? Dad Doug Polk? Uh oh. Maybe I don't know. There's just a probably poker Glance. Table. That's Ashley's favorite. Glance is not my favorite. Shout out to Matt Glance. Now, now recently single Matt Glance. <laughs> recently single Matt Glance. Is this like a new thing? Pretty much. Oh, wow. Well, Matt, get in touch with me when you're in Vegas. I'll uh, take you out with me. And Why you got out, people? <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll see what happens out there, man. So I guess now, so obviously you mentioned W Coop and, you know, Scoop is coming up. By the way, I, I guess we have a lot of people watching right now. Shout out to everybody that's watching. Tomorrow I'll be uh, podcasting Fedor Holes, 3 p.m. Eastern time. The Young Prince will be back on. I think he's going to announce something, too, that he's releasing. And um, we'll, we'll see what happens to that. For anyone, I'm putting a lot of PLO content on my channel as well on YouTube. Shout out to me. And um, I don't know. So just got double, we got Scoop coming up, right? Scoop's in a couple of weeks or something like that? Yeah. Watch out for him with the cat, babe. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Scoop's coming up. I'm still not sure if I'm going to Montreal. Probably going to go. Was, most of my roommates I usually go with decided to back out this year. So I'm still not totally convinced what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll even stay here. But most likely I'll be in, end up in Montreal been my you know mo for the last couple of years yeah don't you usually win about two or three scoops a year i mean i think it's something like that. you win the leaderboard you win a couple of scoops yeah it seems like it happens all the time it seems that's usually why i go is because there's so many events there's so many mixed and like the leaderboard is just so easy for me to win so. <laughs> how's that feel just to do that how do you just do it how do you just not play early online at all and then just go up there and then that's it because it's not really online it's mixed you know and most of the online guys don't get to play mixed too often and it's mixed tournaments and I still know, you know, tournament situations and ICM and all that stuff is kind of, you know, second nature. So the only thing I need to be, you know, in tune with the game when it comes to those non no limit. I'm sure the no limit tournaments I'm gonna to punt and I'm just gonna, you know, play terrible versus everyone, but that's not where the money's to be made for me. What's kind of your main game you're playing now? You mentioned you're putting these 70, 80 hours at the casino. What's uh what you been focusing on? Um, lately at Rivers, it's been, uh, it was 510 No Limit for like the first six weeks. And then uh, I convinced a few guys to play Omaha and I taught them the rules of Omaha. So we've been playing 510 Omaha, a um, little PLO for you. Yeah. Oh. Wait, so what? Been, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> How's that? Wait, there's a, so the great game of Palo in Omaha. So is it 510 with a straddle or what do you guys regulate? Is it, how's it usually play? Uh, sometimes we've gotten a mandatory straddle on it. Other times it hasn't happened. But I just auto straddle because I want to make the gameplay bigger at all times. So I just oh, like get it. So it's just straight PLO and it runs pretty much consistently. Yeah, I think uh, I woke up at like nine in the morning. The game was still running, and then it started running without me being there. I used to be the organizer, but now that I've been out of town, it's still been running every day. Spreading the great game of pot in Omaha around the world, Sean Deeb. I love it, man. I love it. I mean, I'm sure people enjoy it, right? It's a fun game. Obviously, a lot of action. A lot, you never got a fold. You don't got a fold of three bets. I mean, it's... I think I'm people sure. like it because, like, when they get stuck a big amount, they have a chance of getting even. And that's kind of been the thing. Like, in No Limit, you know, you're stuck two buy-ins. It's very tough to get two buy-ins back. But in Omaha, it can be one three-way all in, and you're back. And you can even take slightly the worst with it. Your equity is going to be a lot better if you're trying to gamble than it is in Holden. For sure. Shout to Grimstar in the chat. He says the action there is insane. Is there uh, one game, two game? Is it anything higher? Yeah, in? Like what's kind of, you know, understand how difficult it is to deal with Grimstar every day. He's oh. just, he is, it's a shame the man he's become. He is a shell of what he used to be. He's the tightest player in all the games. 
He does the dumbest shit. He pisses off every fish. He is what not to do as a professional poker player. Really? So, I mean, I do hear from him on Snapchat pretty often. So I, uh, I get to see some of his messages. But you're saying he's, he, he's the tightest player and he pisses off the fish in the game. Yeah, he is just a cancer for the game. And I've actually considered getting the games to be private to shut him out specifically because everyone hates playing with him. Really? So what can somebody do that makes the, uh, hates the people that play with him? Like, what does that guy do? Uh, he's slow when he finally plays a hand. He's always interjecting. He's like, you know, just, he's doing these goofy things with change. He's OCD. He like just, he pit, braids the fish. He calls the clock on them. And like, he does all these things where they just all like, I try, I straddle every hand in every game. So a card was dealt. I put out my straddle. He says, cause it's his big blind. He said, I couldn't straddle. And he gets a floor ruling, and like he won't let the fish straddle. If people want to gamble, he won't let them. If someone tries to like buy in over the cap, he won't let them. He just stops any form of action or fun that people are having. So he makes it a miserable experience. Where the point of they all say they fucking hate him, they don't want to play with him. Wow. He doesn't listen. I begged him to act this way, and yeah, he's just it's bad for the games what he does. Yeah, I mean, it seems like especially at the higher stakes games, you get a couple regulars like that in the games those will kill the games because people aren't going to want to come. And obviously you've got a lot of live experience. So what's like your strategy or what's like, I guess your advice you'd give to people that play live that want to make the, the want to make that time enjoyable for the players. I tell, I tell James all the time. I say, listen, I have your best interests as well. So if I make these games or to be good for everyone, but you need to follow the rules. I said, if I, if I get everyone auto straddling, you're going to be on. But I want to get everyone doing this. You're not going to pull these angles. Like, you know, one situation that I remember was, the main fish of the game runs around, tried to uh, bet in a spot. James had like two people lent it. James potted the button. So he obviously has double suited aces. That's his only potting hand there. That's how bad he plays. And everyone knows he only plays aces. Um, yeah. So the fish like calls and the flop comes. It goes four ways to the flop. It's king, 10, nine, rainbow. Check, check. And the fish like does something with his hand and then grabs chips to bet. And Grim says, oh, you check. And it's clearly the fish wants to bet. He clearly would. He's not an angler, you know. And James clearly wants to check back his, like, aces with a gutter, whatever, turn a backdoor flush draw, whatever he has. He wants – he's talking the fish, and it calls the floor, makes him check. The player gets pissed off. He bets the turn ends up losing to a backdoor flush, and the guy had, like, bottom set and wanted to bet the flop because that's what he does. Hmm. And it was just like – and if he wasn't involved in that pot, he would never have called out and let him bet. So he does all these angles where he enforces rules where it benefits him but doesn't enforce them when it doesn't affect him. And, you know, that just – you can't be biased and you can't – you know, take shots like that. And it's really sad that he has to make money that way in the softest games that are ever around. And, you know, I, he could make money if he actually played normal. He's just a scared little bitch. Bang, bang. I mean, shout out to, shout out to James in the chat right now. We have on the podcast, Grimstar, uh, you know, old online poker player with very, uh, very epic adventure in times. And, and yeah, I mean, obviously I, I, that's kind of unfortunate to hear in terms of someone doing that to the game. And, and like, so I, I try to do this privately and like tell him, you know, one on one a lot. And I try to give him good advice. And I thought we were gonna be friendly in the casino, but he just tried to, you know, be the table captain over me. And if I'm loaning all the fish money, if I'm organizing the game, I'm doing all these things to make the game run. You know, you just have to give me the lead. And if you're gonna go against me in all these situations, we're gonna have. A, a, I'm gonna find a way to get you out of the game. Mm. So is it is he going to be out of the game? I mean, can that go private? Obviously, we know private games in Vegas are very popular now, especially during the summer. So is that something that could potentially be taking place out there? Uh, we just got a new poker manager, so I have to discuss with him what they're going to allow, and you know, and basically go to him and say, like, you know, you want this five ten PLO running every day. These are the requirements to make it run every day. You know, no James, and you know, a few, few other changes to the uh, player pool and the rules of the game. I mean, isn't that kind of like against poker in some ways where you, you just take out players that you don't want in the game? I mean, if that's the case, could you just take out anybody that's winning? I'm not taking him out because he's winning. I'm taking him out because it's a cancer to the game, and it's going to hurt the longevity of the game. No one wants him there, and people have said they aren't going to play if he's in the game. And, you know, we have an option of losing 10 players and playing with one or losing one and playing with 10. So I'm doing what's best for the longevity of the game. Whether James could be winning or losing in the lineups, I still would enforce these rules that I'm enforcing on him. It has nothing to do about him being a winning player or him being a professional player or whatever else. It's strictly of enjoyment factor for the fish, entertainment factor for the fish, and, you know, for longevity of the game. And so he's clearly doing these things that are hurting it. And trust me, I'm someone who's been shut out of hundreds of games that go private. 
You know, I'm trying to have all games, but I know that the only way to get this game to keep running and allow myself to do what I need to do, like, is to, you know, possibly go private, to have that control over the lineup, who gets a seat when we go 10-handed, when we play six-handed, you know. There's just a lot of things where having control can be beneficial and make everyone happier. You sound like Axe from, from the show Billions, man, out there making moves right now, kid. I don't know if you watch Billions, but the, I mean, the guy from House of Cards, uh, what's Kevin Spacey's character? I don't know what his character's name is, man. It sounds like you're out here trying to, trying to make things happen. But I guess, you know, I've, I've heard from other, like, so people out there might be saying, you know, isn't this a little bit over the line and stuff like that. But I've heard this from other people who are, the people who organize these other high stakes games who sort of get the games to run at, ke- at casinos spread out throughout the United States is that, if you have a couple regulars in those games, like the games will die. And if they die, it's going to be hard to build them back up. So you as the person that's professional in charge of it, trying to get it to go, like these are sometimes things you sort of have to do if you're the person that decides to take the lead in, in generating the game on a consistent basis. Yeah, as a game organizer, you know, you have to make sure you keep as many people happy as possible. And, you know, I want to reinforce that the reason you'd be shut out is nothing to do about him winning or losing the game. You know, I don't care. I can. I will. There's a guy who's a losing player. I'm gonna get shut out as well, and that's just because they're seeing their coaching players constantly how to play. They're saying they're showing people that they're folding the second us. They're showing people to not re-raise with aces. Showing people all these things like try to teach them how to play, and it's just ridiculous. Like that's what I'm saying. Like there's they cross the line. What should be said and done during a poker game, and those are the people who I think don't belong. And James consistently does that. You're supposed to re-raise aces all the time. You get them in Popman Omaha. I mean, you got aces. So why, would you, why would you ever not re-raise them, man? How would you not? Yeah, I would never sit at the table. I'm, I'm a, I mean, I guess I do make YouTube videos, I suppose, where thousands of people watch them. But who knows what's real or not in those videos, boys. But I guess a different thing besides being at the table, you know, when you're, like, telling people. I mean, but that's the I'm thing to see, right? This is, like, when people are learning the rules of Omaha that day. And he's giving them, like, very concepts that you learn years after, like, playing. Yeah. I mean, I'm uh, stuff out there. You always three bet aces, guys, and never fold the three bets ever. And um, I mean, listen, these are just common sense things. I don't know, I'm not folding the three bets. But in terms of that, so it sounds like action's going well. But I guess that, that does sound like kind of like a, a small stakes game to play on a regular basis. But do you feel like it's something where it's enough to to be able to make a good amount of money and justify putting in that amount of time rather than potentially relocating to somewhere else where there might be higher stakes games on a consistent basis? I'm more or less just seeing how far I can get these games to run. And if I can get bigger, you know, there's plenty of people with money in this area who are playing the 510 games. They just aren't necessarily like they weren't comfortable with 510 until I started playing there. They were all two five players, you know, but they plenty of them have millions and millions of dollars. It's just now they're getting exposed to 510. Eventually I'm going to get them exposed to 1025 and I'm going to keep, you know, funneling to bigger and bigger games because that's obviously in my best interest. So that's definitely my goal. And, you know, I really like the, the company behind the casino, so I'm trying my best to, you know, be as involved, to get as much off the ground, and to really see how big this this room can get. Hmm. It seems like a lot of casinos popping up on the East Coast. I mean, I heard there's a new casino coming out in Boston. It seems like there are these new casinos popping up with consistent poker action pretty much everywhere. So it seems like East Coast poker is thriving right now. Yeah, poker is huge. Look at some of the tournament. Um, like, what was it? Cherokee had, like, over 1,000 people and... Um, Choctaw had a thousand people on the same weekend, you know, at the same price point. That's thousands of people like for a 1K plus tournament. You know, poker is really, really big in the right areas. And as long as they don't, you know, drain the economy too quickly, you can have longevity and have people hopping from tournament stop to tournament stop. Borgata keeps getting huge results. Parks is getting huge results. You know, there is like poker on the East Coast is huge. And I know California still has been strong, but it's, you know, kind of had a lull. But East Coast is getting bigger and bigger every year with the buy-ins, with the field sizes, and, you know, with how many big cash games are running. Yeah, man, it seems like it, that's awesome, man. And I guess PLO especially, because PLO, that's obviously the game I'm, I'm thinking about. Do you, do you think that PLO has been picking up in terms of interest and in terms of action in games, or have you sort of sort of been the same for these past couple of years? Uh, I don't pay attention that much. I mean, this last two months, the first time I started playing Nolan and PLO, because of the casino opening, before that I just played mixed. And, you know, PLO was in the mix sometimes. It was usually to get a PLO player who wanted to learn mix. But in general, like, Big Bet wasn't a huge part of most of the mix games that are in the lineups that I play. Hmm. Well, hopefully PLO is uh, is getting bigger and bigger. And it will only continue to because it's a great game. It's fun. And you get four cards instead of two. And but you I never have to fold. Five and seven cards and, you know, nine cards and another one. 
Mm. Nine okay. cards? That's just overwhelming. Nine? That's Super Stud 8. You get four cards to start, and then you get your five cards after that, and you play regular Stud 8. So you oh, get I've seen that game. That's a fun game. I actually kind of like that game. You basically get an Omaha hand to start, and then you play down to a Hold'em hand, then you play Stud 8. It's great. I, mean, I, I don't like the idea of Hold'em being in any sort of in my idea in that situation, but... I mean, yeah, that sounds like kind of fun. I watched some Stud 8 before. Or I think it was, what's it called? Super Stud 8 or what's it called? Yeah. Yeah, I've watched that before. And it seemed pretty fun. So people say about five card, by the way, five card, not too many cards for me. Way too much variance in that situation. I mean, four card, a little bit variance too, but not as much as five card PLO. So that's why big O. Oh, I'm not five card like draw games, you know, triple draw, ace to five, Badusi, Badesi. That's what I meant by five cards. Speaking of these mixed games, WSOP's coming up, man. Obviously, we know action last summer was a pretty out of line. A lot of action was going out there. A lot of games running. Are you going to be going out there, or what's kind of the plan for, for you and the family this year? Uh, the plan is family will stay here and me to most likely go there for the whole time. That's what I did last year. It seems the easiest way, but you see what it's like with the kids running around and screaming in here. Like, it's bad. I don't know what's your schedule. I play, you know, 90 hours a week. I play, you know, 18-hour mm -hmm. sessions, sleep for four hours, and go back and do it again. You know, that's kind of my lifestyle. So having the family out there is pretty detrimental to my little sleep that I get. And so probably won't be there and they'll be here, but I gotta go work. I mean, I think we talked about this last year as well, too. It's it's that one time when for this this 45 day period where high six games are running all the time and these games are usually going to be pretty good compared to what you might normally be able to play. So it seems like you've decided, uh, like I think you did this last year too, where you're just going to go out there, you're just going to put that work in, put that time in, make some sacrifices short term, but in the long term, it, you feel like it'll be beneficial for you. Yeah, obviously financially it should be good. I mean, I'm a winning poker player. I should make a lot of money out there. And obviously if there's the good cash games, you get all the fish from other regions all go there during that time. So you get fish you don't get to play with year round. And, you know, you can get some amazing game lineups and, you know, some great players get very tilted. And I've definitely done that, too. I've been the fish of the games during the World Series for a day or two. You know, it happens. Hmm. So how do you readjust your mind when you go from 510 to now playing some of these higher games? And then, you know, you're going to have to go back to 510 potentially in 45 days. So how do you sort of approach that in, in terms of just the mindset needed there? I mean, it's really easy. My tournament background, I mean, I used to play the stars 1k when I had the $3 rebuy right next to it. You know, I always mm -hmm. played the highest stakes and the lowest stakes. So it never really affected me. I just know that you can't spew when you're playing super low and you can't spew when you're playing super high. You just try to win in every game you're in. And that's kind of been what I've been doing. And it's just always been my uh, mentality in poker. So I got one more thing about this program in America thing. So obviously Doug's been on there a lot. Doug's now, uh, the Supreme leader, Douglas K Polk, just uh, everywhere on, on YouTube. And now on, on that game, What's kind of your thoughts? Because obviously, you know, I feel like there was this uh, little bit of live pro versus Doug. You know, you got Ewas in the mix. You got Ite in the mix there. It seemed like there was a little bit of needling going back and forth from you guys to Doug. And he's more of this online Mr. GTO, Mr. I'm going to tell you what to do with Queen Queen versus Jack Jack at the table for everyone to hear. So what's kind of your uh, your thoughts on, on Doug and, and playing these games and, and his whole approach to what he's doing right now? I think Doug is great for the show. I think, uh, you know, he's been a huge addition to the show. I think we're going to see him in a lot of episodes in the future. I think when me and him did commentary with Kate Hall, we both had a great time. You know, yes, we have differing mindsets. We're from a similar generation, but I think it works really well because we have respect for each other, you know? And that's mm -hmm. something that isn't there too often with people who have such vastly different views. And obviously, there's some things that Doug will say that I'll just laugh at and say, wow, he's so dumb. And I'll say some things about strategy that Doug probably sitting in his thing saying he's wins mon money with that thought. And, you know, it just goes back to, like I always say in poker is there's a thousand ways to win. So don't be so confident that your way is correct or your way is the only way to win. You know, let people play their cards the way they want. It might work for them. You may not understand why it's profitable or why they think it's profitable, but let it go. And I'm, you know, a big proponent of letting people make their own decisions. That's why when people, you know, talk about strategy at a table, I get really pissed because you're wrong most of the time what you say, and you're actually going to hurt someone you're trying to help more often. You're going to misapply the concepts that you say. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's, I think that's um, um, a little bit. A little bit echo. Echo. I think yeah, that's, I think that's, that's very hard. Hard. I, to I keep hearing the echo. Hold on a second. Let's see if it goes away. Lag. Okay. No, nope, you're way. Yeah, I think sometimes the, the worry is that when you give somebody advice on how to play, like let's say I tell someone they were full to a three bet at PLO. Well, now, like I might be able to do that because I played five million hands at PLO and I, I've been in every every sort of situation against different stack sizes and different players. 
But now other people out there have no idea how to play the queen two four five with the queen high suit post flop when they flop comes king two four. Like now, you know, I mean, you give them that advice and then they're going to misapply that concept and they're probably going to lose a lot of money. And I think that's a very accurate thing. And yeah, I, I, I think that's a good point. But Doug does seem to like enjoy talking strategy at the table during these games. And I guess uh, I don't know. If it, I, it sounds like you're not a big fan of that. I mean, in Poker Night, it's a little different than a regular game. And I think Doug, like, because his strategy is all about being balanced and, you know, and these situations. And we're playing a one-and-done lineup with a crowd you're never going to play with, you know. Most of us will. Most of us weren't even no-limit players. I mean, Eric plays mostly mix. Ite plays mostly mix. I play a lot of mix. Clancy plays mix. Cantu doesn't play any hands. And, you know, Kyle is just on cloud nine every hand he plays. So, you know, it was really funny him, like, explaining why. He's like, oh, like, the hand in particular, like, he opened the button and I called him the straddle with Jacks. He's like, you have yeah, to open that, that, that hand. And I'm like, well, Doug, you know, against a good player, I need to balance sometimes. And you're, I'm shocked you think it's always a three bet. You're going to play really well in position and you're like on the tighter side. So you're not going to just stack off, you know, queen 10 on a 10 high board for, you know, 30K or, you know, float the jack high board and get it in with ace queen when you turn an ace like Kyle will do, you know. Bang, bang. Def definitely people, you know, you play differently versus and. If, if Doug's going to, you know, try to abuse me and barrel me, I'm going to, you know, call with some strong hands. And he's going to think my range is capped in the spot when it's not, when I'm going to have a set of jacks and he's not going to think it's possible. Yeah, he definitely thought that was one of the worst plays I think he's ever seen in his life when you just called with the jacks when he had kings there. Yeah, which is so funny. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I did enjoy the dynamic you two had during commentary because, as you mentioned, you guys each – have your own stances on things and it wasn't really any conceding on either end which i enjoyed i enjoyed the dynamic and as you mentioned you guys do have both have respect for each other i mean i i'm i would imagine a doug has respect for your game and and just respect for what you've accomplished and your success you've had in poker so while he might not agree with the direction you're coming from i feel like there is sort of i mean maybe he doesn't i don't know i gotta ask him about this i, I can't i don't want to speak for doug you never know doug's crazy man he who knows what he fucking thinks hey you know if he has no respect for me I'm still going to be fine. You know, my, I don't get off on people, you know, having high opinion of me. I just get off on how much money I win in poker. You know, that's my number one goal mm. is to provide for my family. Mm. So I, I wish I had more of a fishy image in some spots, you know, so that people wouldn't think I was so tough because I do try to make poker fun. I do try to like, not just squeeze out every bit of EV. I do gamble in a lot of spots. I shouldn't because I like action and you know, that's my way of being a degenerate. <laughs> Uh, Nelson laughing in the chat says, Joe, Sean is the reason Rivers Casino is growing. Action is nuts with eight S's. Well, oh, okay. Yeah, Nelson is uh, one of the guys I recruited from 1-2 to 5-10. Uh, he's a great guy, though. What do you mean? How do you recruit, recruit someone from 1-2 to 5-10? It seems like a slight, slightly big jump there. He's going to figure it out. He's a really sharp guy. And uh, he took a shot and won a bunch at 5-10. And then, uh, you know, his wife gave permission to play a little bit more with the big boys. I like that, man. Let me check a couple comments from the chat. What's going on, everybody out there, man? I see we got a lot of comments, a lot of regulars out there. Uh, Jamie C. Feel on Twitch says, Doug thinks Sean is a fish who emphasizes live raids too much and doesn't consider hand rages and GTO enough. Okay. Hmm. Uh, okay, I think I was looking for another comment there. Was there a question here somewhere about this? No, I guess not. Never mind. That was a question. Okay. Uh, ask Sean, how did he bring me up from 1-2 to 5-10? <laughs> <laughs> He walked over and said, this looks like fun. And I said, you should sit in. And he was there. And he realized the game was softer than he thought it was. So all the money being won. And that's it? I mean, you need money in that spot, right? You need... Like... I, I'm not worried about Nelson. Okay. I like it. Let's say a couple questions from the chat, guys. Let me see what we got out here. I see Crush Live Poker. Is that my boy Bart in the chat? What's he talking about? Uh, let's see. Jonah says, please smash the like button to end the pandemic. Yeah, man. Everyone's all, all about the fucking likes on the YouTube game here. So... Uh, let's see. So you got Scoop coming up, right? You got Scoop, World Series of Poker. Then what's after that? Is it just like a big lull until W Coop, I think? No, I got Poker Night in America is actually coming to Rivers in Schenectady. So that's going to be big for me. I'm going to try to, you know, showcase some of the local talent and the guys I play with regularly. There's a whole cast of characters, you know, East Coast, New York poker. Everyone's got nicknames. Everyone's got stories. Everyone rips on each other. It is like I'm at home, you know. It's like 20 Matt glances at every table. <laughs> Yeah, it seemed like Ntali was a little bit, he was like the subdued sort of peacemaker at this table, I, which I didn't, I didn't know that was possible, but it seemed like he was the guy that was low-key there. You know, especially because he's been friendly with Hashtag before, and I don't know how friendly you're me after this weekend, but, you know, he was one of the people that hung out with him before and defended him. And, you know, he tried to 
being friends with both of us, try to be the mediator because Glance wasn't doing his job. Bang, bang. Yeah, so you, wait, do you think Matt actually wasn't doing a good job on the show there at Dirt when yeah, it actually took place? A lot of times he should have told the hashtag to shut up and let other people talk. Whether it was me and Cantor trying into it, it was Douglas trying to speak. He just screamed over everybody. And, you know, he just crossed the line because we have unusable footage from that, I'm pretty sure now, because no one else got to talk. Hmm. Shout out to Dentali, man. I don't know, man. I, I, I'm, I just can't hate on someone that like, also likes to wear tank tops as often as he does because I like to wear tank tops too and people give me shit for it all the time. So like it. He says we force him to on the show. That's his redeeming quality. He force, you force him to wear tank tops on the show? He says Glance does. Oh, for the sex appeal? He's, what does he think? The ladies are tuning in for the arms or something like that? Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> Fucking how would I? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, ask Sean why he hates Todd Wattellis, a.k.a. Dandruff. Uh, I mean, the guy just went off and spouted on his show that I was cheating in open face and quoted Barry Greenstein when I was all bullshit. So, I mean, that was years ago. I've never interacted with him since, but anyone who just makes those accusations without even contacting me or even giving me a chance to defend myself is just clearly got one of those guys who are just doing anything for views. And, you know, those are what the type of people we don't want in poker anymore. Hmm. Let me see here. Uh, a degen story. Do you have a degen story? I imagine you might have a degen story to share. I mean, what's more degen than playing W Cube for my son's birth? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty degen, dude. Yeah. I mean, I, and you missed his sister's wedding. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, my, my sister was trolling me because she put up all these wedding photos around the house, and they're pictures of her, her husband, my dad, and all my siblings. And they're just all over the house of the family photos, and I'm clearly not in any of them. So I said you could at least Photoshop me in a few. You could have got a cardboard cut out of me and put around the wedding, you know, at least lie to you, you know, people down the road that I was there. I think somebody gave a speech as you. Oh, uh, uh, my wife was telling me apparently my brother gave a speech as me at the wedding. So I guess <laughs> I was there in some way. S. Deep, has he ever smoked weed? He seems like the anti weed type. I used to be one of the biggest potheads in poker. I haven't done it in many years, but. It was definitely a key part of my life for a while. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like that. I don't. Is is weed still a big part of the tournament poker player community? Because I remember back in the day, man, every tournament player I know smoked weed constantly. That's all they did was just smoke weed and play online poker. I don't know because I really don't hang out with the tournament crowd too often. You know, when I go to stops, it's very few, and I'm usually hanging out with you know my group, who most of them don't smoke. So I don't know what everyone else does these days. Yeah, so you actually something I want to talk about. So you, you said something about what happened with Jason. So was that something that's like a, a public thing, or is that like is that something you can talk about in terms of what happened to you and Jason Mercier? I mean, you know, eventually, like you gamble with someone big very frequently, you have falling outs, and you know, we just disagreed on this subject, and we both thought the other person was wrong, and you know, we just had a falling out over that. It was not a huge deal, nothing. Like I'm sure down the road we'll be very friendly again, but mm -hmm. as of now, you know, we're not as close as we used to be. Hmm. Yeah, I found that surprising when I heard that in the show because I always knew you guys and you know a, a lot of that crew. You guys were pretty close, so when I heard that, I was I was just a bit surprised. I haven't heard anything about that before. Yeah, so. it's just you know, not everything gets public. That's kind of what gentlemen do and what classy people do. I mean, you'd think that in theory, but I mean, it seems like in poker, all, all the kind of stuff gets public. I mean, obviously, a lot of stuff doesn't get public as well, too. But it, it seems like there are some things that are made public that I don't know necessarily they need to be made public all the time. Yeah. So uh, let me find some more questions. A couple more questions here. We'll wrap things up with Sean. Uh, let's see here. I mean, overall, it seems like Poker in America is going pretty well, though. It seems like the, the, the games are being more consistent. Obviously, Matt's trying to tinker with these ideas, bring these more interesting people to the game to, to draw some interest. And I think it's good for poker to sort of feature different players outside of just maybe the traditional sort of big name players who were on ESPN back in the day and maybe give other people a platform who are also interesting and good at poker and maybe turn them, turn them into people who people want to pay attention to. Yeah. I think they've definitely had some budding stars on the show who weren't as, you know, known even me myself. I wasn't, I was known, but not as known. The show was a, you know, a lot of exposure to the random crowd. And you know how often people reference the Madison hand to me. And, you know, the hand that Jeremy Kaufman played with me, everyone's going to talk about that once it airs, you know, on TV. You know, mm -hmm. I've been involved in some of the more memorable experiences on that show. So it's definitely helped my notoriety for sure. And I owe a lot of my, you know, exposure to them. And that's why I'm so happy to help them out in any way because they've been so good to me and always given me a spot on the show when I ask. 
Yeah, I think that's um, a good point about yourself is that you definitely have been getting a lot of exposure from that. I personally enjoy watching you play. I feel like you're not in it. You like action. You're there to mix it up. You're not just looking to fold every hand, which is, I mean, that's sort of what you want out of the people that you're going to be watching on on the stream or on television. You want people that are going to talk, have some fun, sort of battle it up a little bit and provide for a, a good experience for, for the other players in the game too. Yeah. So, uh, you want to give a shout out? You want to give a shout out to anybody? Um. Well, apparently, Glance has asked me to shout out to my gay friend, DJ. So, okay. uh, for DJ. Shout out to the gay friend, DJ. Shout out to DJ out there. Let me give a couple of shouts here real quick. We got, who else we got? I know we're going to have a lot of people say, say shout me out now. My buddy Hassan Hawk in the chat, BMCX100. I see Crush Lab Poker, Zenny, Petros Puppy, Toot, Low Ray, Big Ticket 88, Kip Slip, Jonah, my wizard assistant in the chat, and who's always doing wizardly assistant things for myself. Monsler's in the chat. This weird ass mother, Howard LJR in the chat, one of the weirdest guys I've ever seen in my goddamn life. Masterpiece, Andrew Fidelic, uh, da, 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 Trespasser, I, I got too many, man. Sven, Limit Holden Guy, Gary Denevy, Riff Raff, Shout, da, 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 da. I'm losing my mind here, man. Losing my mind. Any, uh, Sean, any, anything else on your mind potentially you want to you bring up or want to talk about? Um, just, you know, bring up the point of remember the boycott, stand strong with Sean. So anyone else who wants to join in, even if you're not known, just, you know, not watching any shows that he's on, even when he's not on after the fact, you know, and watch the viewership drop and watch, uh, you know, these brands tank themselves, associating themselves with such a, uh, you know, negative person in a negative situation. Stand strong with Sean. I mean, listen, I don't know. I I'm, I, I think I'm still going to watch some of the live at the bike action. I, it's like a, it's interesting. It's entertaining in a weird way. I don't know. You want to see punishment. You want to see this sort of, you know, as much as like I don't necessarily want to support the cause at the same time, it is sort of like when in poker, you don't really have many things that are entertaining like this, I suppose. So it, I guess it's... Well, I, I think you're right on that, but you know, there's other avenues to see it besides watching it directly. If they have the lower viewership and you're going to see the clips and people talk about it on your Twitter, you're going to get a GIF or something. But anything that removes the hits from their, their accounts is, you know, something that will hurt them long term. All right, guys, stand strong with Sean. Hashtag, I want to see it out on Twitter. Make sure that you, uh, I, lo I, I love, I didn't even know you were such like this, like this, uh, the, like the enemy of the state on Poker Night America before this. I thought, I would just assume that people like, like, like watching you on TV because you're talking, your personality, but that's not the case. Like, they it's don't. Slowly as time goes on, the more slow rolls, the more shit talking, the more things I'm involved in, you know, people like the stance I take and, you know, the battles I get into that people are just like, fuck you, you know. So, so they've been building up enemies over the years and now suddenly they all flipped real quickly. So that was pretty cool. Now I'll probably just steadily lose them over the next few years again. I thought that was fun. I liked that. That was the things I liked you just brought up. I was like, oh, this is like fun. Well, you're, you're a different personality. You know, you're, you're more, I don't know. I don't want to insult you, but you know, you're different than uh, the average audience. <laughs> different. I mean, listen, man, that's okay. I know I'm a little, I'm a little, uh, you got to be insane, man, to... to, to you still blue hair. I mean, come on. You're clearly not normal. Yeah, man. I don't know. I, I mean, listen, that was a GTO move, by the way. That was a very smart decision I made in my life at the time. I had some very interesting encounters and experiences with people that I might not have otherwise had them with if I didn't have that blue hair. So, but yeah, looking back on that blue hair, I'm like, what the fuck, man? It was like, that was the time we did the pod last time I think I had the blue hair going on. We had some stuff going on for sure. Yeah, you know, no gamble, no future, man. All okay. right, a couple more shots. Big Ticket 88. I saw Joe Young out there uh gary devaney i'm trying to give more people shout outs man i know you guys love the shout outs out here i know the edge sean is broke now selling cam shows no what do you always know you're talking about man sean <laughs> how much would it take for you to a cam show sean to a what a cam show <laughs> oh <one of> the <laughs> yeah, what's your no cam show right sean you gotta go tell you well what's your number for you to go on a camera like a like a, a chatter bait or something like that and put on a show for the fans Probably for like people. two million. How much? Two million. Two million? You do it? Probably. I don't know if I. I mean, man, I don't know if I would do it. <laughs> they got that video forever is going to be a GIF on there. I just. It's it's okay, you know. I can say you know a million went to each my kids. That's that's good enough for me. I mean, listen, man, I can't argue with that. So, uh, guys in the chat, appreciate all the comments, appreciate all the questions. You want to follow Sean on Twitter? It's at Sean Deeb, S H A U N Deeb. Uh, you on Instagram? You got anything like that? Any IG or anything? I'm no Instagram, no Snapchat. I'm just a boring old man. Boring old man. Um, 
Uh, what do you guys say? We want to start the GoFundMe? We're not starting the GoFundMe for Sean to get on camera. No, no, we're not doing that. But yeah, Sean, appreciate you coming on. Thanks for talking. We'll be paying attention uh, in these upcoming shows, and I wish you luck at the scoop. I'm sure we'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll take down something there, man. Yeah, I'll try for two. That's the goal. All right, guys. Everyone, chat. Appreciate all the comments, questions on my Instagram. I just joined Poppy GTO. That's it. Peace out. Adios. Much love. Take care.